right. It's time to get a little bloody. Let's talk about chapter 14, part two, holes anatomy. This is hemostasis is what we're gonna begin with. Hemo blood, stasis, staying. So it's a blood clot, okay. Uh, for clotting blood, we need to stop the flow of blood. This is typically caused from a break in a blood vessel. When it's not, it's a problem. It's a thrombus, we'll talk about that later. Um, and hemostasis has three parts. One, platelet plug formation. Two, vascular spasms. We'll learn about spasming today. Many of you know that well, especially the guys. And three, coagulation or clotting, okay? Um, so these three phases I wanna show you here with a, a sh quick uh, tutorial, which you can uh, click on as well yourself. So what you see here is damage to um, blood vessels. Um, this is a capillary in this case that we're showing. Uh, actually, not a capillary, but uh, maybe an arterial, okay? Um, when these vessels are damaged, they're basically what we're gonna do is, uh, as you can read here, I'm basically going through these things. It, this is gonna be more complicated than you need to know, but this is the best video that shows all these things, okay? Um, well, let's go through. So damage occurs. Here we see vasoconstriction, okay, which is caused by the vascular spasms that we talked about. Uh, these are collagen fibers that stick out uh, still in that area of damage. And when the um, platelets, those purple things, stick to the collagen, they become sticky. Okay? And we'll zoom in on that. As more platelets get stuck, they start to release chemicals. Okay? And this attracts more platelets. Specifically, this is serotonin. Um, and that serotonin attracts more platelets to come to the area. Do, 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 do. Clot forming, clot forming, clot forming. Okay. Then, then there's a series of chemical reactions um, involving a lot of factors, as they call them. There's, up, there's 12 factors. Okay. You don't need to know all these factors. That's not the important part. We will touch on a couple of them later when we talk of a couple different blood diseases, such as hemophilia, which is a uh, deficiency in a certain factor. But in general, these factors are a cascade mechanism. One thing reacts with another and another and another to solidify and to cause this clotting to occur, okay? <clears throat> are you going? Okay. One thing you do need to know is that prothrombin gets activated into thrombin, and then thrombin works with the clot and triggers fibrinogen to be converted into fibrin, and together that forms the fibrin meshwork. Um, these cross links of fibers that form the clot itself, okay? And then sometimes you'll see blood cells get stuck in the clot, not sometimes, all the time, and that's why the clot looks red um, and it plugs the hole. This is not a, a scar. This is not a scab yet. This is just the clot forming. A scab will be the end result of this, um, but initially it's just a blood clot. Okay, so let's minimize this and continue going through one more time. Collagen fibers exposed by a break in a blood vessel. Plates become sticky and they cling to the fibers. Um, and then they release serotonin to recruit more platelets and they pile up to form what we call a platelet plug. Vascular spasms occur also due to the serotonin, uh, which causes that vasoconstriction and shrinking of the uh, vessel wall, um, decreasing blood loss. And now coagulation occurs. The tissues that are, have been damaged release thromboplastin, thromboplastin. Now, thromboplastin interacts with an, another chemical called PF3 um, and those two together, uh, as well as some other factors, as we said, and some calcium triggers this cascade of factor to factor to factor to factor, okay? And that gets us to prothrombin, okay? Prothrombin gets converted to thrombin, and then thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which forms the clot. Now, just a little sort of general thing that you may see again. Hear this term fibrinogen. Anytime you see a word that ends in ogen, um, that means it's an inactive enzyme. So fibrinogen is an enzyme um, that you have in your, um, on the, in your body 
but you don't want it active all the time because then it would form clots all over the place. So it's inactive and not until it gets activated into fibrin that's the active form. These inactive enzymes we call zymogens, Z-Y-M-O gins, uh, G-E-N-S, which is why um, fibrinogen, that's the, the suffix, the basis for it. Okay? So that's uh, hemostasis or blood clotting. It'll last between three to six minutes, or it'll take, not last. It'll take three to six minutes to occur. Um, and then underneath the clot uh, and underneath this um, scab that has formed, you'll start regenerating cells, uh, skin cells and so on. And often scar tissue, as you know, um, will form in place because it regenerates faster than uh, skin does. If you pull off the scab, as many of us have done in the past, you will prompt the formation of even more scar tissue more quickly um, to, to um, close up that hole in your body, um, as opposed to allowing an ample time for skin, for example, to fill in the gap. Um, and then once everything is repaired, the, uh, the clock gets broken down and eliminated. Now, as I mentioned, sometimes clotting happens when you don't want it to. So if you have a blood vessel that hasn't been damaged and you still have a clot that forms, that's called a thrombus. Okay? A thrombus can cause uh, a heart attack. Um, a thrombus can cause a stroke. Um, and a thrombus can cause an embolism. An embolism is a traveling thrombus. When that thrombus breaks away from its attachment on the inside of the blood vessel, it'll travel freely through the bloodstream. And if it goes into a smaller diameter uh, blood vessel, it can get stuck and cause a backup and all the blood uh, won't pass through the, this uh, embolus. And uh, the, the cells on the other side of the clot will be starved and they'll die. Uh, this is a very typical way that strokes occur. Um, this is why they say when you're in an airplane and you're sitting for long periods of time, you're supposed to get up and move around to allow the blood flow to go through your legs because the pressure of the chair on your, um, uh, on your legs, on the uh, underside of your legs, can cause a thrombus to form. And then uh, if you haven't moved around, that thrombus can break off when you get off the plane into an embolism. Um, and quite often that embolus uh, can get stuck in the lungs and they'll people will have a pulmonary embolism uh, as a result of flying. Um, so when you fly every few hours, move around. There's also certain bleeding disorders. Thrombocytopenia, once again, we see the penia, but this case we have uh, due to platelet deficiency. Um, normal movements can cause tiny, tiny bleeds all over um, because they don't have enough platelets for clotting. So these people um, one of the characteristic symptoms is they have little dots, little red uh, dots um, on their skin where there are little patches of bleeding all over. Uh, hemophilia, you've probably heard of, is clotting disorder. Uh, it's hereditary. Normal factors are missing, so they can't clot blood. So a simple nick from shaving, for example, um, can cause them to bleed endlessly. So they often apply chemicals on the outside to, to promote um, clotting. Uh, again, thrombocytopenia will also cause this bleeding type thing. Now, if you lose lots of blood, uh, that can be a problem. Yeah. So if you lose 15 to 30 percent, you, uh, it causes weakness. If you lose over 30 percent, you can die uh, through shock. Uh, again, remember that low blood pressure is far more dangerous than high blood pressure, at least in the short term. Uh, temporarily, they may put in um, saline to help boost the blood volume to maintain your pressure, but that's only for a short period of time because you're not getting enough oxygen to all your tissues, there's no extra oxygen, uh, oxygen gas in saline. So you need to get transfused, meaning you need a uh, blood uh, transfusion. And it needs to be your own blood group, of course, okay? Uh, we'll determine your blood group when we do our blood typing, assuming you want to do that. Um, but your blood type is determined by proteins that are on the surface of the red blood cell, and we call these antigens. Now these antigens are, just like on every other cell, they can be attacked by the immune system if your immune system deems them foreign. Um, if your immune system gets trained to see certain antigens, then it won't attack them anymore um, or at all. And this is your self-antigens as we describe them. Um, so when we try to determine what blood type you have, you type it using antibodies. So you put blood uh, and expose it to different antibodies. And if the antibodies attach to the blood and cause it to coagulate, well then, um, 
you can determine that blood type. So A antibodies will attack the A antigen. And if it clots, well, you know that you have the A antigen, for example. We call this clotting um, agglutination. Agglutination is clotting when they clump together the antibodies and the uh, antigens. So there's actually really over 30 common red cell antigens uh, on the surface of the cell. But the ones that are uh, attacked by the immune system are basically from the ABO blood group and the RH uh, antigens. So we only look at those for the most part uh, when we talk about blood type. Although if you get a transplant, for example, uh, they will look at many, many more antigens um, to match, which is why it's so difficult to find a match for transplantation. We know there's type A, there's type B, and there's type O blood groups, and then there's also type AB. If you are type A, you have the A antigens, and you do not have the B antigens. Okay? If you have the type O blood, you don't have A, you don't have B. That's basically naked, if you like. Um, all right. So then there's also the RH groups, which are named because of the RH antigens. RH stands for rhesus, like rhesus monkeys. Um, they also call it agglutinogen D. Um, now, most of you are RH positive, okay? The highest percentage blood type in the United States is actually O positive. I'm O positive. Um, it's, I think, 40% of the population is O positive. But uh, there's something very interesting um, in pregnancy. <clears throat> um, if the mother... Um, is RH negative and has a baby that is RH positive. Let's say she has a baby with a man who's RH positive. He gives his gene to the baby and now the baby is RH positive. Uh, that can be a problem, okay? Um, because the mother's immune system will be exposed to the RH antigen in the baby's blood, but the mother's immune system will have never seen the RH antigen. So the RH antigen will be attacked by the mother's immune system. Now, here's a weird thing. In the first pregnancy, if this occurs, nothing happens. Okay? Uh, doctors are kind of aware of it now, but the baby is not um, attacked. Nothing really happens. It's sensitized to this RH antigen, basically. And the second pregnancy, the second time the mother goes through this, she has to take uh, immunosuppressants to prevent her immune system from attacking the baby. Um, and aborting it. Otherwise, the, the second pregnancy will um, be attacked and it won't survive. Um, so the mother's immune system produces antibodies to attack the RH blood, and we call this hemolytic disease of the newborn. Hemolytic disease. Uh, pretty interesting. Blood typing will get in detail, so we'll run through this really fast. Uh, blood samples are mixed with anti-A and anti-B serum to see which one coagulates. Um, and then you cross-match and you look which ones, uh, you compare them all, which ones clotted, which ones didn't. Um, last topic here is just developmental aspects. Uh, blood cell formation, you know in adults, occurs in the red marrow and the ends of long bones. But when you're a fetus, you don't have all this marrow in the ends of long bones. So blood cell formation in the fetus actually occurs in the liver and in the spleen. It's funny because later on, those are the areas that help to remove dead blood cells. But in the fetus, um, the liver and spleen make blood cell formation, uh, make blood cells. And then uh, at about month seven, hematopoiesis, which is formation of blood cells, uh, is taken over by the bone marrow. Your, your bones are now large enough, you have enough bone marrow, red marrow, to produce it. And then lastly, uh, fetal hemoglobin. Uh, a woman has hemoglobin that binds strongly to oxygen, but in the placenta, the area where the blood vessels uh, cross and mom's um, nutrients diffuse into the baby's blood, and blood is kind of shared in, in a way, if you like, um, the oxygen has to be taken off the mother's hemoglobin, which binds oxygen very strongly, and put on to the fetal hemoglobin so that oxygen can go over to the baby, because, of course, the baby doesn't use uh, its lungs. So fetal hemoglobin actually has a strong affinity for oxygen as well, slightly higher than the mother. So as fetal hemoglobin passes by mother's hemoglobin, the oxygen will move from the mother's hemoglobin onto the baby, uh, onto the baby's hemoglobin, and um, the baby will get its oxygen. Okay? And on that note, I'm out.